Lord of the Rings cards are already here, and today I will show you 3 decks that got upgraded with these powerful tools, plus a bonus brew featuring improvised club that you should definitely try. But first, let's talk about Casting to the Fire and Lempas. These two cards are a great addition to the format as both are perfect in decks like Boros Synthesizer as seen in the latest Pauper Gedon decklists. So I decided to come up with one and try it out. Our first match is against Celestia Bubbles. We have some dead cards like Journey to Nowhere and Casting to the Fire, so we'll have to side those out for further games. On the other hand, cards like Downbringer Cleric are very good, especially when paired with Gore Sky Fisher, as they can get rid of their problematic enchantments or opponents play. And as long as they don't give trample to their critters with Armadillo Clock, we can stall the game while all value them with our artifacts. So far, their creatures are not very threatening, so we can use a combination of both Lembas and Experimental Synthesizer to dig further into the library. Plus, with the Bardot Battle Fist, we can apply extra pressure in the air by equipping it to our flyers. However, we found our Drunkbringer Cleric, which will let us get rid of the clock immediately, and proceed to apply pressure while they don't have a cards in their hand. We found a second Dunbringer Cleric that dealt with one of their arrows and they scoop. For Cyborg, we get rid of Journey to Nowhere and Casting to the Fire as they are somewhat dead. And the only thing that we can bring are two Dungbringer Clerics and a Relic of Reanitus to at least cycle it when needed. Unlike our last game, the opponent had a terrific start and put us into a fast clock, which later became a very early scoop on my part to move to our final game. We keep a decent hand, relying on our Dungbringer Cleric to deal with their enchantments. They play a couple of spells and I added a Barber Battle Fist to stop the Bogle from attacking. Or at least that was the plan as they quickly gave it first strike, which made my blocks useless as they also gave trample to the creature. As planned, they draw and bring a clear, deal with the first strike aura and now the plan is to return it with Corsica Fisher to deal with further threats. They play a free wind falcon which I didn't understand at first and even though it's overall weaker than my flyers, they can start putting auras into it and kill me in the air. And while they play a second armadillo clock on the falcon, I didn't expect it to attack, something I was happy to see as I was more than okay trading two of my fires for three of their cards. After that, my opponent ran out of steam while we were chaining multiple spells and putting a lot of pressure with their flyers and equipments. They soon realized this and scooped the game. Our second deck is Catgate, which relies on Lambas and Golden Ed to be used to bring back our Cauldron Premier to the battlefield. And thanks to Basilisk Gates, our little friend is always guaranteed to be a deadly threat. We also run Improvised Club as a Sacrifice Outlet and Cast Into the Fire as a Cyber Option, giving this deck a huge upgrade to stand out in the meta. We will be playing against Affinity in this matchup, and our Cyber cards, especially Cast Into the Fire, should be good against them. In this game, however, we are already in a bad spot, as we drew too many copies of our cats, and no card draw engines to get value from them. On top of that, our mana is a little shaky, meaning we can't keep up with our value spells overall. It was just a matter of turns until we lose due to the removal spells and meter forces. So we moved now to a game number two. As I mentioned, Casting to the Fire is excellent against their indestructible lands, and getting rid of their mana base on early turns is the key to winning the game. Thanks to our country artifacts, we found a second Casting to the Fire, which slowed them down, allowing us to get ahead in the game. And three Basilisk games in play represent a fast clock for them in the next couple of turns. I use one of the X. To fix my mana to some extent and found the much needed land to improve my situation. Now, if they don't have an answer for a sacred cat, they are in big trouble, as it can deal massive damage thanks to the multiple gates activations I got available, and if they kill it, it can come back thanks to its embalm ability. I decided to kill their blocker to deal considerable amount of damage to them, but I also drew an epicure, which I want to use to distribute our damage over the next turn and also loot the excess of lands we may have. They try to catch up with their mana artifacts but cannot deal with both creatures simultaneously and ended up eating some damage in the process. Some more interactions happened and after popping a cat, they were in Galvanic Blast range, moving us to a final game. This hand is excellent as we have access to our cyber cards and we got some cool cat food interaction. As it happened in game number 2, dealing with their mana is critical and despite the rebuilding in a decent pace, this little interaction has put us very far ahead in the race. Unfortunately, they drew a Clark type Shaman, which is somewhat bad news for us, but with two foods already in play, the only real creature they dealt with was the Epicure, and on top of that, they now can't attack with the Progmite unless they want to lose in combat. I pumped a cat with no response on their end, so I decided not to tap out for a second activation, as they could just quickly kill the second cat if I tap out without losing value. Otherwise, I could have dealt some damage to them with massive munitions. They added a second minion force into the world, but two activations of Massilis Gates made our cats out of range, and they are now forced to trade for one of them. 
They look at more cards in the library, but have yet to find an answer for the cats and consider. Thunder's Rat is the most powerful damage spell, but it's hard to cast. Unless we put it on top of our library with cards like Prison of Isengard. It does that and gives you a body that can leave you a blocker or a semi-decent threat in the field. With it and Bloodwater Entity, we now have two ways to put the best burn spell from the format at the top of our library, so you can choose which is better for you. I decided to upgrade my latest Thunderous Rat Brew and try it out. This time we face Altertron, and with a combination of counter spells and removal, this is an easy match. Because they don't run many creatures, I decided that sending two lightning bolts to their face was good enough, so I could resolve an LD Tolarian Terror to keep up with their pressure. Eventually, they could set up the Tron combo on their next turn, but they were too far ahead to deal with the second terror and scoop the game. For Cyborg, we bring some counter spells, and that should be good enough to stop their plans. This hand showcases the power of Photonder's Rat. As thanks to Brainstorm, I can now stack them to the top to deal 5 damage in back to back turns, and with the Treason of Isengard in hand, we now have access to an extra 5 damage. That being said, on their turn I use a Brainstorm, revealing a third copy of Thunder's Rat, and I put the two other copies on top of my library, meaning that from one turn to another, I dealt 10 damage to her face. They countered my Parablast, but after revealing the third rat, they decided it was enough and scooped. Last but not least, we got our bonus brew around Tentative Donation. I know, this card is not from the latest set, but with Rohirrim Lancer and Improvised Club, this deck is tons of fun. As for one mana, you can steal your opponent's creature, attack with it, and deal 4 damage to their face. It seems silly, but it's amusing to pull off, as showcased in this game. We got paired against Reanimator, and oh boy, if we get to steal and sack an Ulema Crusher, I can retire from my happily. We also got the perfect setup already, so we only need to keep a creature with menace to pull it off. After looting one of my artifacts, I reveal a Mayhem Patrol with menace, meaning our combo is already assembled. All we need to do now is to wait. After some interaction happened, they managed to pull off their combo, but they fell right into our trap, and after taking some damage, we proceed to steal their big Eldrassi but the scoop on the spot so that we couldn't sacrifice it. For Cyber, I brought some greater hate, and that's good enough for us to win the game, as it shuts down the whole strategy. And we can just pressure them by playing a regular aggro match, and thanks to Kulotra Revert, this game seems to be almost over. Still, they managed to get rid of our improvised club, which was annoying, and when I attack on my next turn, they pull off a trick to create some board presses that could stop my attacks. After a few plays on their end, I decided to loot a land to get more value cards in hand, and revealed a Mayhem Patrol, which will be great to pressure them by pumping our creatures. We traded most of our board, but I am still in the dominant spot, despite them playing a Gourmet Angler. I attacked putting them down to 5 life, and after they tried using the Reanimator spell, I excited their graveyard, brought by my Epicure to the battlefield, and won the game. Now, if you are new to Pauper and want to test other cool decks, click into that playlist. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.